Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for this. I'm so grateful to CV for hosting this event, making these meetings possible, and for me to speak in front of so many inspiring people. World Water Week is an important opportunity to meet practitioners, researchers, and policymakers in the water sector. And I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, congratulate Anders Bentel and his team for what he has done with CV and uh, wish good luck to Torgny Holmgren in the uh, work that lies ahead. And to all of you as well, congratulations for coming here. Thank you so much for doing that, but also to wish you good luck for this important week. And yes, it's correct. I was in Rio de Janeiro uh, in June this year. The negotiations were tough, and not all our ambitions were fulfilled, but I think we should not be discouraged. The outcome document, as I see it, is an important platform for all of us to build on and implement in our own national context, but also that we met together to elaborate about where do we stand when it comes to global development, what are our opportunities and responsibilities. Sweden is persistent in placing the individual at the center of sustainable development. We gained support for this in the final document, and it is in light of this that I would like to share with you two perspectives that I brought back with me from Rio. They are both consistent with our vision for the future in terms of sustainable development and water and food security. First, I'd like to emphasize the need for innovation and collaboration with corporations and small businesses. The needs are significant and far beyond the reach of the donor community on its own. We need to find new approaches to investments and not least new partners. In seeking these partnerships, we need to be open-minded and look for new and fresh ideas, and for actors complementing the traditional channels and partnerships among international organizations. Secondly, a positive political environment of democratic values with participation and accountability is essential in addressing water and food security at national and local level. Democratic governance with respect for human dignity and for human rights is key if we are to find solutions to the global challenges that affects us all. In less than uh, 40 years time, the world's population will have increased by a third to nine billion people. I know that all of you that are here are aware about that. And we have seen that we have managed well, as Jen said in the, his opening remarks. Each and every one of those bil nine billion people will want access to basic goods and services, starting with food, clean water and sanitation, basic needs, as well as shelter and education and health care. These people will inevitably need energy. They will also need new technology, better communication and transportation. The solutions must be radically more sustainable than we have managed so far. In a finite biosphere, achieving this will require new thinking. However, we know that it's possible. Innovations have historically changed the lives of millions of people for the better. Just think about vaccines, improved grain varieties, and more recently, the impact of mobile phones. The less well-known innovations are often found in poor countries among large number of people surviving on very low incomes, but who are or have to be very resilient and often creative entrepreneurs or citizens. And we have to find these innovations because they are often about crafting business solutions that are relevant to poor people and about making them available to the many. 
Low-cost mobile financial services and insurances are among the most recent ideas, but I'm sure that there are many more opportunities out there. Innovations have provided many new employment opportunities across Africa. Small, affordable packages of improved seeds or fertilizers have reduced the barriers of upfront cost for poor farmers. Some of the most important growth markets today are African and Asian. Increasingly, business is looking for innovative models, building on local ideas and demands, rather than adapting products and distribution processes that were conceived for US or the European markets. If we can find similar innovations and scale up it in a sustainable manner, the lives of millions of people, if not hundreds of millions, could improve. As a way to attain economic and, and, and environmental gains within and across sectors and ease demands on water, land and energy, Sweden is, within its bilateral development cooperation, setting up a new finance instrument called Water Innovation Challenge Fund. The main aim of the instrument is to capture and support the implementation of innovative ideas and new technologies regarding increased water resource efficiency. It is also about finding new ways to sustainable, sustainably identify the use of water, land and energy in production to achieve equitable social, economic and environmentally sound development. Simply put, we need to create more with less. This is, to me, innovation at its best. When it comes to water and sanitation, Swedish development assistance keeps a high profile bilaterally as well as multilaterally. However, we can do more, and I believe we should. Water and sanitation is just simply that important. My ambition is therefore to increase our effort in this critical area, and I hope that that will also be reflected in the Swedish aid budget for 2013, in the time where we have now to fulfill the Millennium Development Goals. Everybody should have access to clean water and sanitation, and those of us who have it have to be responsible to help those who don't. Ladies and gentlemen, now more than ever, we need to encourage new thinking in our development assistance. We need to reflect on lessons learned and find out whether and what can be done better. One of the most important lessons has to do with partnerships. It is clear to us that no one single actor can solve development challenges. Firstly, official donors cannot mobilize all the resources. Neither can developing country budgets. Today, foreign direct investment, commercial finance, remittances and philanthropic flows account for the bulk of financial flows to the developing world. Official development assistance can only complement trade, private investments and remittances. Secondly, it is clear that many of the technologies and skills needed rest with the private sector players, businesses, are skilled at building supply chains and commercializing ideas and expanding ideas. Thirdly, donors, foundations, research institutions, and civil society organizations can contribute technical assistance, policy dialogue, and field expertise. However, they are often unable to engage with other partners, for example, with business in a systematic basis or to scale up activities. In other words, each partner may have assets to bring to the table, but they must be matched with other partners' abilities and resources to create a good mix that enables the initiative as a whole to move ahead and to grow. When resources, water, arable land, and other natural resources become scarcer, we know that those without power will lose out and become even more vulnerable. For water and food security to be possible at the national level, there has to be a positive political and economic climate. To achieve this, efforts to prevent or resolve armed conflicts are essential. But efforts must go even deeper than that. 
Democratic governance and human rights, responsible leadership, effective rule of law, and functioning institutions that are free from corruption and that support sustainable growth and international trade are fundamental to both water and food security and society as a whole. Therefore, my basic premise for global sustainability is a people-centered approach. Sustainable development must consider the rights, the needs, and influence of everyone. When people are empowered, they are truly inspiring entrepreneurs. Let us look at one example, such as disaster risk reduction in the Sahel. The evidence shows that farmers in drought-worn areas of West Africa, for example, Nigeria, have started their own greening of their communities by using simple soil and water conservation technologies, techniques without any external assistance at all. Through satellite images, we can immediately see a clear improvement in green cover and trees planted, and thus the greening of a large area of land in Niger by these fairly simple investments. Similar investments in irrigation in drought prone areas in Mali have been founded by IFAD with substantial improvements in food security as a consequence. And my own flagship in development assistance, so-called open aid, was created by a village in Mali, Bugula, where they asked for accountability and transparency. There are a lot of initiatives going on driven by those people affected. And all of you that are gathering here have these examples. Let us use this week to share them and to find inspiration and hope. Empowered individuals truly are those that inspire us most. And therefore, voice and agency must be given to all groups in the society. Sustainable development, addressing water and food security is dependent on long-term commitment and the building of trust between stakeholders. This can only be achieved through the full participation of stakeholders at all levels. And you that are here today have direct voice and access, and I'm quite sure that you will use it wisely. That means that the poor people in the rural areas, women's groups in the sub-Saharan Africa and civil society groups in Southeast Asia, must also be able to make their voices heard and their views through democratic channels to achieve equitable and efficient development. Ladies and gentlemen, may I conclude? Progress is essentially about people. Giving every individual a chance to use their abilities and resources to influence their own lives and their own future should be our main objective. Good luck with the week and thank you for coming here.